Right. Take your Bible and drop it. No, don't. No, don't. By now, it should drop by itself at uh, 1 Peter. Uh, we are in chapter 3, so you can open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's give the band a hand as they go off. Thank you, guys. You've served us well. Well done. Right, so we've been journeying through the book of First Peter as the pastor makes small talk to find his space in the scriptures. Right, from verse 13. Are you all there? 1 Peter 3 verse 13, we'll be reading till 4 verse 2, I believe. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ as, as Lord, the Lord as holy. Ready at any time, say any time, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you to, uh, for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that when uh, you are accused, not if, when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. In it, uh, a, a few, that is eight people, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. Therefore, say so therefore, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same understanding because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, Father God, and, and it cuts us to the heart, Lord. It, it pierces our, our hearts, Lord Jesus. I pray that uh, this morning your word will, will come through clearly. Uh, I pray for myself, Lord, that you will anoint my words, that uh, I won't say anything that I shouldn't, that I'll preach your gospel with kindness, with gentleness, Father God, but with great zeal in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, I preached a sermon from 1 Peter 2 uh, on the theology of suffering and submission. Uh, the sermon title was The Public Life and Conduct of an Exile. Um, that's sort of part one of, of this message. You can go and listen to it. Um, in this passage that we just read, Peter continues sort of his teaching on, on suffering uh, and what the Christian response should be. And even when the suffering, not if, even when the suffering seems to be unjust or undeserved. So we're going to be unpacking this scripture. I don't really have points this morning. So if you're taking note, good notes, good luck. Um, <laughs> it's, it's on you. You can go listen to the sermon again. So we're just going to be sort of going through the passage and trying to make sense of which turns out to be actually a difficult piece of scripture, and we'll see that later. So 1 Peter 3 verse 13, who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? Sort of a bit of a rhetorical question there. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. 
Matthew 5 is 10, Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount says to his disciples, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. See, health and wealth and prosperity gospel teachers will teach you that if you do everything in a godly way, everything will go well. Almost as if a godly life will um, make you immune to the suffering of this world. And I want to say to you, this is not the full truth of the Bible. It's a lie. It's a dangerous teaching because God has got a lot to say about suffering. In actual fact, I think a lot more to say about human suffering than what he says about victory. So this teaching of, of health, wealth, and prosperity, and um, if we do everything good, you know, it will go good with me. It's a lie, it's dangerous, and we should be very careful of that teaching. Well, godly conduct may in some cases earn you favor with the world, and I've, and I've really experienced by being a, 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 a godly person in my workplace, it's earned me some sort of favor uh, in some instances with my employer and in others not. But sometimes by operating within a godly parameter, um, it does earn us favor with, with the world around us. And um, I do believe that God blesses our obedience, that there's blessing in our obedience, but there's no guarantee that by living a godly lifestyle, you will be free from suffering. The Bible doesn't teach that. Suffering is yet to stay. In fact, John 16 verse 33 assures us that in this world there will be suffering. Jesus addressing his disciples and then he says, but fear not or, or have courage. I have conquered the world. Why would we need courage? Why would, would we need not fear if it's just going to go well all the time? Okay, I sound like a doom prophet. The opposite of the health, wealth, and prosperity. But this is the gospel, friends. But there's hope. Hang in there. Don't, don't, don't run away. You must remember that the message of the gospel is fully foolishness to the world. It's a stumbling block. And they don't get it. People want to hear what their itchy ears want to hear. They only want to hear the good stuff. So do not be surprised when you face adversity when you live a godly and God-honoring lifestyle. This does not always result in uh, the blessing in the way that we see blessing to be or that man has made blessing to be. Verse 14 of our passage, second half of verse 14, it says, Do not fear them, or, um, or in other words, do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. Who shouldn't we fear? Well, those that persecute us. Now, persecution to the, the, the modern-day Christian or in the Western world is, is sort of a bit of a strange term because we don't live under physical persecution really anymore uh, in the way that we saw in the, in the communist era. So most of the Western world is pretty free to worship as they please. So, so public persecution is, is pretty rare, I would say, in the, in the Western world. Um, and so it makes it difficult for us to relate to this, to this topic of persecution. Uh, for, for Peter's, belief, for, for Peter's um, sort of audience that he was writing to, for them, living out their faith could mean death, imprisonment, um, being martyred. Um, so, so they had a very, very good understanding of what this, this means. But I want to argue that today, um, persecution is actually very real. It's just taken a little bit of a different form. It's very subtle, and, uh, but equally as dangerous and, and destructive as it would have been in those days. Um, talking to a friend in the week, he was telling me how um, he, uh, he was at a, at a family function, and he said no to another drink and no to staying longer because he wanted to go home and be fresh for church the next day, and he got ridiculed for this. And um, the family said to him, he's a hypocrite and, and all sorts of ugly stuff. And um, purely because he wanted to do, to do the God-honoring thing. This is persecution. People are ostracized or judged for choosing not to partake in sinful behavior or dodgy business dealings. And in some cases, you don't get the contract or you don't get the promotion because you say no. And, and, and this is a form of persecution. 
So another guy who's willing to do the dodgy dealings and, and, and do the dodgy stuff gets the, gets the financial benefit, and you who do the godly thing don't get it. But God blesses us in another way. We are slandered by the cancel culture for standing up for what we believe in God's word is right. So if I stand up and, and I say male and female, he created them, cancel culture will cancel me out. As we speak, there's a court case going. I won't name names. You may be aware of what's happening. Um, but um, where, where somebody stood up on a stage and spoke out about, uh, against the, let me get this right, LGBTQ+, plus, is that correct? Um, sort of um, fad of, of the day. And, and this guy is being publicly persecuted by the South African Human Rights Commission for speaking out against that. And same with me for standing here and just saying that I believe that this is a demonic attack on our, on, on, on our children's sexuality. I will be persecuted for that if that gets into the wrong hands. For believing what God says in his word. So persecution, friends, is alive and well. It looks a bit different. We're not being put up on the stake. We're not being put in the coliseums. But it's alive and well. Verse 15 says, but in your hearts regard Christ Lord, the Lord as holy. I often say this, so settle in your heart that irrelevant of the outcome of my trial or my suffering or whatever I'm going through, irrelevant of the outcome, I will look to God and decide in my heart that God is a good father. And if, if, if whatever I believe influences the, the or, or what, whatever I believe the, the, the outcome of my trial is not, does not sort of align with what I believe. It is not God that's not true to his word. It's my understanding of God's word that needs to be altered. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So if the situation does not go the way I thought it should, it's not God's character or promise that is flawed. It's my understanding and my interpretation of what I see in God's word that needs to be altered. But regard Christ as Lord in your hearts. When you go, don't wait until the trial comes and then try and convince yourself that God is good. In the victory, say to yourself, God is good. Life is not just two complete extremes. It sometimes feels like it. In the normal day to day, when you wake up in the morning, say to yourself, God is good. Settle that in your heart that God is a good father. So Regard Christ as the Lord as holy. Second half of verse 15. Being ready at any time. Say any time. To give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. He says, preach the word. Be ready in and out of season. Well, Vic, if I may. I know you won't mind. On Wednesday evening, we had a, a worship and prayer evening, and at the end of the evening, I felt in my heart to call him Vic up to come and share a word of encouragement with the congregation. I had confidence in my heart to call him Vic up because um Vic has got a testimony that he regards Christ as Lord and that he's ready, ready in and out of season to preach the gospel and to share a word of encouragement. You see, our readiness is part of our armor to stand against the enemy's attacks. Ephesians 6 verse 10 to 15 says, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and in his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in heaven. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist the evil. Uh, the, uh, the, so that you may be able to resist the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Therefore, with truth like the belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. Being ready, friends, in and out of season is part of our defense mechanism 
to fend off the fiery attacks of the enemy that he brings against us and against those that are around us. We speak hope into situations. When a friend is in trouble, we come and we are ready with a word of encouragement. And we speak life. We don't speak death. We can partake. We can partake in the moaning and groaning. We can partake in the complaining about the suffering. Or we can say, friend, but God, I hear you and I sympathize with your suffering, but God, who is rich in mercy, has conquered the evil one. And he will see you through this moment. Our readiness is a defense mechanism. Am I only a situationally ready person? I battle to pronounce that. Am I only a situationally ready person? Am I only ready when the situation suits me, when I'm feeling God's presence, or when it's going well? Or am I ready at any time to give an account and to give a witness? I know Vic's not having a fun time in his business, and I know he's not having a fun time in his, in his health. But you know what, friends? I can call on him at any time. I can call him up now, and he'll have a word of encouragement. And I'm not... I'm not putting on Vic on a pedestal, but I'm using it as an example because he's a normal guy sitting in the same seat for the last 20 years. And I don't even have to look where Vic is because Vic and Mary are sitting right there. Friends, how ready are we to share the good news? Whether it's going well with us or whether we are in a time of trial and suffering, how ready are we? Verse 16, it says, yet do this with gentleness and reverence. The world doesn't need another arrogant person standing on a soapbox saying, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like the sinful tax collectors around me. What will impact the world is a testimony of normal men and women with feet of clay. It says, Lord, I'm not perfect, but I know that Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross. And based on that, I've been justified, I've been redeemed, and I can walk this road. As a believer, you are no better than any unbeliever. You're just better off. I'm going to say that again. As a believer, you are no better than any other person. You are just better off. Why? Because you've got Christ. Because you've got Jesus Christ. Because you've got your eyes set on eternity. You are part of God's household. Besties, this is not even of your own doing. <laughs> it's not something I did myself. It's because of Christ's free gift of salvation. Can't earn it. Can't work for it. Nothing I do can make my salvation more complete. Because if there is such a thing, Ephesians 2 verse 9 says, then we can boast about it. I cannot stand up here and boast about my salvation because it, is, it was given to me. Christ did it for me when I was still his enemy. Solo mentioned it this morning. While I was still his enemy, Christ died for me on the cross. I didn't even know I needed him. And he died for me. And he said, come into my household. So when we testify or minister from a position of victory or suffering, because whether you find yourself in a position of victory or whether you find yourself in a position of suffering, we testify. We do it with great gentleness and kindness. Realizing that we too are in desperate need of God's grace and His mercy every minute of our lives. Are you there? A little bit intense. Are we doing all right? Verse 16 says, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. Keeping a clear conscience. Now, this is where we, where we start saying, I can do this. My conscience is clear. I can do this. Friends, I want to remind you that the only reason why your conscience would be clear would be because of Christ's work on the cross, not because of your own doing. Remember, it is, not the, uh, it is not just the world that will bring accusation against you. Satan, the enemy of our relationship to God, also called the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says that he goes day and night and brings accusation against the brethren, against the saved people. 
He will come after your conscience and he will try and stain your conscience and he will bring condemnation against you. See, conviction is one thing. Conviction is God, God's work by the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the Holy Spirit comes and he convicts us of our sins. But the moment condemnation enters, that feeling of guilt, it is the work of the enemy. Because if you are a Christian this morning, God has said over your life, it is finished. The work is done. You are not guilty. Jesus died for that sin. Think of a court case analogy. God is a righteous judge. He's sitting on his seat. Satan is going around as the, as the prosecutor, bringing accusation against you. And Jesus, in our defense, points to the cross and he says, My blood flowed for this brother and sister. And the verdict over their life is not guilty. And he takes our sin and our stains and he takes it upon himself. And there's a transfer that happens in this moment where we get Christ's righteousness and he takes our sin upon himself. So keeping a clear conscience. It is the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ that puts our accusers to shame. Not our own doing. So it's not your good works that puts your accuser to shame. It's the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and you putting your faith in that is what puts the accusers to shame. Not you being a good Johnny. Not you doing things right. Yes, the fruit of your life will be good works when we follow Christ. Brilliant. But this is not always a perfect science. We get it wrong. Am I the only one that gets it wrong? Thank you, Jono. The last guy that God is fully right was put on a cross. That's a reality. Verse 17, it says, For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will. God's will that we suffer. Can we just pause there for a minute? For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will. Process that than for doing evil. So what he's saying is rather suffer the judgment or persecution of man than to suffer God's judgment apart from Christ. So if we have to suffer for a little while, the persecution of man, it's okay. Friends, what you don't want is to stand in front of God one day without Christ in your life. It's not something you want. The judgment's going to be far worse than whatever the world can do to you right now. Now we're moving into, a, into verse 18. Band, you guys can make your way up. I'll, uh, I'll give you a cue when you can start supporting me. I've asked the band to be ready with this because uh, the passage of Scripture that we're moving into, I've put on my notes here, buckle up. So if you've got a seatbelt, buckle up. If you've got a crash helmet, put it on. Uh, when you pick up a commentary on a, on a passage of Scripture and it says this is some of the toughest stuff you'll have to chew through in the, in the New Testament. It gets exciting. Um, but I believe God will enable us to understand His Word. And um, yeah, we're going to do that. It says in verse 18, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. So that's what we spoke about just now. Uh, we call this the great exchange. Jesus lives a sinless life making him the perfect sacrifice. Remember in the Old Testament, the priest had to take the spotless lamb and take it to the altar and, and, and slaughter the spotless lamb on behalf of the sins of the people. Okay, so Jesus is that spotless lamb, the perfect lamb that was slain. So he fulfills the full requirement of the law by being the spotless lamb. He endures a death which was ours to endure. So the punishment that was ours, he takes upon himself. He endures that death. He breaks the barrier of original sin that brought about spiritual separation between God and man. So remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the separation between God and man. And all of a sudden there was all these sacrificial um, moments of atonement that happened so that man can, can sort of have a connection to God. And Jesus Christ comes and he breaks this barrier that separates us from God's presence. It says once and for all, or once for all. 
the righteous for the unrighteous. So once for all, Jesus says on the cross, when he blows out his last breath, he says, it is finished. And in that moment, this curtain in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, tears. And it's symbolic to say, you can now enter my presence. And Jesus restores the relationship between God, the creator, and man, his creation. He brings us together. That he might bring you to God. So this literally means that we may have an audience with God. This, this, this language that is used in the original text in the Greek means that somebody has arranged you an audience with a higher authority. So that you can go and plead your case. But the reality is we don't need to go plead our case. We just have an audience in front of God. That's what Jesus does for us. He gives us an audience in front of God. Because remember, in the Old Testament, people could not get in front of God. The priests had to go through all the ceremonial cleansing to go on behalf of the people. They had to cleanse themselves to represent us to the Father in the Holy of Holies. And Jesus pays the price for, us for, 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 for our sins by the flowing of his blood, just like the spotless lamb did this. Hang in there, we're going here somewhere with us. Now, because of Jesus, we can get an audience with the Father. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. You see, we don't approach God's throne of grace with fear, friends. We approach it with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can approach God's presence because Jesus through his blood, gives us an audience with the Father. And we can enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. And we can enter the throne room of grace with boldness in our hearts, not with fear. Verse 18, second section, this is where it gets quite interesting. It says he, I'm going to ask um, the team to put that up. So what I've done is just to try and talk through this and to navigate this, this piece of passage that gets really tricky. I've put, in, put sort of just my explanations of it in, in red brackets. Now, this is not me editing text in any way. I'm not adding or subtracting to the Bible, I promise you. This is my best effort in studying the Scripture and understanding or trying to understand what this passage teaches us because I believe it's important. It says he, so speaking of Jesus, was put to death in the flesh. So Jesus suffered a physical death. It's not a hypothetical. It's not just a spiritual death. Jesus suffered a physical death, body and spirit. Okay? Remember that. But he was made alive by the spirit. So he was raised to life by the spirit in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. What the heck? I think if we go too much into that detail, we're going to get lost. But Jesus made a proclamation of victory over death. Remember, a third of the angels rebelled in heaven against God. And they were cast out of heaven with Satan. So Jesus proclaims victory over death to the third of the evil spirits that, he was, that was cast out of heaven. So that's the, in, in, in my understanding, the, 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 the proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Friends, God didn't just act severely on mankind. Yes, with the original sin, there was an immediate act. But then there was a time period where God was very patient with mankind. He was very patient, and when it got to the point where it could not go on any longer, God executed judgment in the flood. He's a patient God. It's God's character. He's rich in love, and He's patient with us. Demonstrating God's patience with mankind's rebellion. In it, in what? In the ark that represents Christ's salvation, a few, that is eight people, that's Noah and his family, were saved through the water. So Noah's ark is a prophetic picture of Christ's salvation to come. So by the time Jesus came, 
the Jewish scholars looked at Jesus' sacrifice and those that accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior looked at Jesus' sacrifice and they say, wait, we've seen this before. In Noah's Ark, there was a safety place for people where they were safe from God's judgment. And that was the Ark. So it's a prophetic picture of Christ's salvation to come. So at the return of Jesus, and I want to say to you, friends, he will come again. He is coming back. God's judgment will fall against mankind just like the floodwaters did. And only those that are in the ark, which is Jesus, will be saved. Does that make sense? Verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this. So baptism, which is a symbolic of the salvation of Christ, just like the ark was. Just like the ark painted a picture and gave us a picture of the salvation in Christ, the act of baptism does the same. It's symbolic. Now saves you. So it's not the act that saves you. It's the idea, the, 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 what it symbolizes that saves you. So many will take the scripture and say, well, baptism now saves us. No, no, friends, it's not the baptism that saves you. It's the picture of baptism, dying to yourself, being raised from the dead like Christ was raised from the dead and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. So it's not the act of baptism that washes us. It says not as the, the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. Remember what we said about a good conscience. Good conscience, not because of me, because of Jesus. Very important. This good conscience doesn't mean I've got a good conscience because of my self-effort. It means I've got a good conscience because of Jesus Christ. And it says it's there, through the resurrection. So it's not the act of baptism that washes you clean, but the good conscience to God, which is in Christ Jesus. Through the resurrection, and I believe when it says resurrection, it means the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. So everything, the full package, even though it only says resurrection. It means through the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which only comes by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. So that's the two-thirds that didn't get cast out of heaven, the angelic beings that did not rebel with Satan. It carries on. It says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself. Also with the same understanding, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desire, but for God's will. So because of the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus, we are now no longer enslaved to our sinful natures. We are no longer enslaved to it. And through him, we are able to resist our sinful desires and live for God's will. That's basically what it says. So in a nutshell, what have I said this morning? Our suffering should not cause us to question God's character or fear man, but drive us to always be ready to testify about the hope we have in Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of our suffering. Remember that you need God's grace and mercy as much as this unsafe person next to you. So when we minister, we minister with gentleness and kindness, not with judgment. They're not standing on our soapbox and pointing a finger and say, you lot. It's not what I'm doing. A clear conscience is not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And Jesus who suffered in the flesh and died a physical death for us, witnessed to the accusing sp evil spirits of old, saves us and sets us free from our sinful desires. So the same way Noah and his family were saved from the flood, in the same way that is a prophetic symbol of Christ's salvation, in the same way the symbol of baptism witnesses to our salvation through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Having this witness enables us to rejoice even in our suffering and live for God's will for our lives. I'm going to land it there. I'm going to ask us to stand.
just stretch out our hands and uh, just in an act of surrender and just Lord we, we receive you this morning I pray Father God even though this was a, a bit of a chewy word Lord and it can get very technical Father your, your gospel is simple enough for a two-year-old to understand it yet it's complex enough to keep us busy for ages so Lord I pray that the simplicity of the gospel will come through in power this morning Lord Jesus I pray that your message will sink deep into our hearts that we will understand the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for us and that we will know that we have an audience with the Father and in every moment in our lives, Father God, no matter where we are, whether we are in trouble or whether we are rejoicing, where we are in victory or whether we are suffering, Father God, we've got the audience with our Father. By the blood of Jesus Christ, we can enter your throne room. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for our sins. and restored the relationship with the Father in Jesus' name. Amen.